Well, everybody loves a good detour, right? Um, I do want to invite you to, to join me in the book of 2 Corinthians this morning. 2 Corinthians, we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 11. Um, just given the uncertainty of uh, how things are going to go this weekend, how many people would be here this morning, what things happen in my own life this week, um, I thought it, it best to spend our time together today reflecting on a passage that has always been dear to my heart, particularly as it concerns suffering and trials. And again, while there's so many of us here this morning, it might be easy to, to forget just how severe this weekend could have been. And so I think it's fitting to reflect, upon, uh, reflect a little bit upon trial in our life today. And I want to do so from this, this passage in 2 Corinthians, and then we can, Lord willing, give our full attention and do uh, the due weight that Genesis 3 14 and following deserve. We can do that next week. So 2 Corinthians, uh, we'll do 3 through 11 today, and I'll introduce it all um, by referring you to Jonathan Edwards. He was born on October 5th, in 1703, to Timothy and Esther Stoddard Edwards in East Windsor, Connecticut. Jonathan was a brilliant young man. When he was 13, his father enrolled him at the newly founded Collegiate School of Connecticut, later to be known as Yale College. He graduated at the head of his class in 1720. He spent his life preaching and eventually was called to be president of Princeton College on February 16, 1758. One month into his presidency, there was an outbreak of smallpox, and Edwards chose to be inoculated to prove to others that there was no need to fear this medicinal advance. And in a strange providence, Edwards uh, contracted a secondary infection and died on March 22nd, only five weeks into his presidency. His wife, Sarah, spoke upon the news of her husband's death. She said, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands on our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had him, Jonathan, for so long. But my God lives and he has my heart. And like Sarah, Charles Spurgeon is thought to have once eloquently said, I have learned to kiss the wave that drives me against the rock of ages. Spurgeon, like Sarah, had learned to embrace the hardships of life because they, like waves that thrash ships in the ocean or winds that thrash against our homes, they threw him upon the rock of ages. The Edwardses, the Spurgeons of history, and countless others have learned to embrace the suffering in their lives and it's important that we periodically, at least, take time to remember to do the same. And it's from that statement, um, if you want a title for the sermon, that I have drawn the statement from Spurgeon, that I've drawn the title of the sermon, Descendants of Death, Kissing the Wave. And so let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. 
For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. Suffering is part and parcel of the Christian life. Really, it it just comes with living on planet earth after Genesis 3. But Christians, we should be acutely aware of the reality of suffering. Some of you know this experience quite well. You know what affliction feels like. You know what it is to suffer for the sake of Christ. You know what it is to lose someone that you love. You know what it's like to struggle with sin. You know how it feels to wonder where the money is going to come, when it's going to come, when that important fix is going to happen. Some of you perhaps know suffering to a degree that some of us cannot even imagine. And all of us have felt it to some degree this weekend. The uncertainty, right? The, the, I don't know about you, but I approached the storm with a high degree of casualness this week. Uh, I think when I, someone mentioned to me that the, the wind should be here by 8 p.m. on Thursday night, and by 8.30 I thought, well, that was nothing. <laughs> Only to wake up without power in the middle of the night scared children and wind whipping all about the house. I heard from several of you, you know, at some point needing to hide in a closet. It's scary. And then the effects afterwards, even now, for days perhaps, people, some folks in our county, surrounding counties, not having power, water. But even in such a tough weekend, or one that could have been worse, we can, according to Paul, nevertheless have hope. We can rejoice. The essence of our passage is a blessing from Paul, extolling the God of all comfort. You know, as Westerners, comfort is, um, what's the opposite of a curse word? It's it's, it's It's one of the most important things that we have, comfort, it seems. And I was struck, even just reading this passage, how many times Paul uses the word comfort. God is the God of all comfort. And he gives thanks to God for God's provisions in his life. Paul's usual MO is to give thanks to God for the church to whom he's writing. But here he's been hurt by the the Corinthians. And so he's, he's thanking God for preserving him through the hurt. And he's also making his forgiveness of the Corinthians known, and he's writing to them to encourage them in suffering. And so I want to do the same for you this morning under four headings. First, we'll look at verses 3 to 5 and consider the blessing that comes with affliction. And verses uh, six, to 6 and 7, we'll see a, a reason for affliction. Third, we will see Paul's hope in affliction in verses 8 to 10. And then fourth, we'll ponder a proper response to affliction in verse 11. So we have the blessing of affliction, a reason for affliction, hope in affliction, and a response to affliction. In verses 3 to 5 then, we see Paul uh, begin his address to the Corinthians by blessing God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, highlighting two characteristics of this God. He is the Father of all mercies, and He is the God of all comfort. He is not just merciful, He's the Father of all mercy. 
All mercy comes from God. And He's not just the God of comfort. He's the God of all comfort. Comfort originates with God. Apart from Him, there is no true comfort to be found. We attempt to comfort ourselves and pacify ourselves with lots of things. But apart from the Lord, that work is in vain. As we've seen in Genesis 3, we attempt to cover ourselves with leaves, as Adam and Eve did in the garden. We try to comfort ourselves with various pleasures, but they leave us empty. They fail us, and they remind us that we have no comfort. In an instant, all the earthly goods that you have can be taken from you. God alone is where true lasting comfort can be found. Paul continues in verse 4, This Father of mercies, the God of comforts, is the one who comforts us in all our afflictions. He's not just the God of some mercy, not just the God of some comfort, or the God of all mercy and comfort who comforts us in some of our afflictions. God is not, Paul is not making a general statement about God usually comforting his people. Comfort can possibly be found at times in God when we are afflicted. He comforts us in all our afflictions. When he was taken to be jailed, Samuel Rutherford once wrote, in haste, making for my palace in Aberdeen. He says in the letter, no king is better provided for than I. Sweet, sweet and easy is the cross of my Lord. My chains are over gilded with gold. No pen, no words, no genius can express to you the loveliness of my only Lord, Jesus. Oh, the sweet comfort that comes to the Christian through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian has a limitless supply of comfort to which he can turn in times of trouble. Do you, dear Christian, understand that God has not left you here with no access to Him when difficulties come your way? God is a comfort to the Corinthians. He is a comfort to us in every affliction. Paul goes on in verse 5. He says, We we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. The idea here is that while Paul, Paul and his companions are partakers of the reproach of Christ and they endure suffering and persecution for the sake of his name, they are abundantly comforted. The comforting hand of Paul's loving Lord can do far more for him than his affliction can trouble him. Christian, hear the word of God for you this morning. If you are suffering, let me rephrase, to whatever degree you are suffering, hear those words. God is a comfort, the only true comfort that you have in every affliction. And so why is affliction a blessing? Because in our affliction, God draws near to us. It's a blessing because it it lifts, forces us to look to God. Right? I I know for, for some of you, it is hard just getting out of bed some days. Maybe most days. There's a great blessing that comes through suffering. You receive comfort from God. God, the Lord Jesus, personally comforts you. God upholds you in your suffering. And he gives you strength. Right now, he's giving you strength, dear one, to make it another day. In your suffering, God draws near to you that you may lean upon his breast and enjoy great communion and comfort with him. Can't you hear the voice of your heavenly Father? Can't you hear him speaking to you this morning in his word? Child, be still. The sorrow will last for the night, but joy is coming with the morning. 
O oh, Christian, doubt not the love of God for you this morning in your suffering. Run to him, for in your trials and, tr- and, and troubles, he is there for you. In the 1700s, Katharina von Schlegel penned a hymn that has since become quite well known. One of my favorites, uh, one that we sing here, Be Still My Soul. She writes, Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. So fret not, dear Christian, the Lord is on your side. He will be with you, and he will not let you fall. Even in the midst of your greatest suffering, God is your comfort and your heavenly friend. And so secondly, verses 6 to 7, we see a reason for affliction. Why does God bring affliction upon the lives of his children. Well, we see partly what we just saw. It's because it provides a blessing, but there's, there's more going on there. Because we then ask, why does God comfort us in our afflictions? Well, there are many answers, I think, but Paul has one in mind in particular in this passage. And it is so that we may be able to comfort others who are in any affliction with the comfort that we receive from God. He says that in verse 4, and then picks up in verses 6 and 7. All right, verse 4, he comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. God comforts us for the purpose of enabling us and equipping us to comfort others when they are in trouble. God comforts us so that our gaze is turned from ourselves, which is where it so quickly runs in trouble. Our gaze turns to others who are suffering. Paul writes in verse 6, If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we're comforted, it's for your comfort. The purpose of Paul's suffering is for the benefit of the Corinthians. God comforts him in his affliction, not just so that he will be comforted as an end in itself, but that so Paul will be able to comfort others who are suffering. Paul's specific and actual sufferings in life have equipped him to comfort and to benefit others in their sufferings. And so too, our sufferings in life, as we are comforted by God in them. They equip us and prepare us to be a blessing and a benefit to others. And Paul says at the end of verse 6 that the Corinthians share in the comfort of Paul and his companions when they patiently endure the same sufferings that Paul suffers. Right? You have suffered in your life whatever it is that you suffered. And you, for this purpose among others, so that you will be able to comfort others who are enduring affliction now. Your suffering isn't pointless. If you suffer, you will be comforted by God. And if you are comforted by God, it's so that you will know God's love and compassion for you And so that you will be able to comfort others who need comforting. And then in verse 7, Paul strikes a note of hope. He says that his hope for the Corinthians is unshaken. And he stresses again that as they share in suffering, so they will share in comfort. And so it is for us. Well, third thing that we see is that this hope that we have in suffering. What is Paul's hope in affliction? Here's an apt summary of verses 8 through 10 by one commentator. He says, Paul now informs the Corinthians of the dire nature of his recent brush with death in the province of Asia. 
an experience so devastating that only through God's direct intervention was his life spared. The outcome was the surrender of his self-dependence and the realization that further encounters with death awaited him. But if the Corinthians were faithful in their intercession for him, he would continue to enjoy deliverance from death's clutches. Paul wants the Corinthians to be aware of the dramatic effects this disaster, this affliction had on him. He doesn't give us specific details as to what the affliction was, but rather he simply points to the nature of the affliction and what it produced in him. It was to be a means of encouragement and exhortation to the Corinthians to persevere in suffering. He says we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. The NET translation of the Bible says that Paul was burdened excessively beyond his strength so that he despaired of even living. These two phrases that Paul uses to describe this burden, uh, beyond measure and beyond his ability to endure, they truly highlight how oppressive this experience was. Now we tend to use hyperbolic language a lot in our, our culture. And so maybe we, we read right over Paul's words here on our own. But if we slow down and we, we consider what Paul is saying, it, it was truly an utterly anguishing experience. The word translated, we despaired here, carries with it the idea of total unavailability of an exit from oppressive suffering. Paul had come to a place where he was so weighed down, he was so burdened that he believed life itself was slipping away from him. Though Paul had been delivered time and again by God, he had been so crushed in this moment that he just knew that his life was over. This was it. He had received, in other words, a death sentence. He felt as though he was an inmate on death row, merely awaiting for his imminent execution. The order had been signed. It was just a matter of time before the axe was to fall. So why does Paul tell the Corinthians this? Why am I telling you this? Why did Paul have to despair of life itself? Why must we come to do the same? That doesn't sound very hopeful. I thought this was a point about hope. Well, Paul says that he received a death sentence so that he would not rely on himself, but on God who raises the dead. Paul was to stop being self-sufficient and to start more fully relying upon God. Relying upon God. In what way? Well, relying upon God as the one who raises people from the dead. Paul was driven to the point of despair without a visible way of escape, not for the purpose of despairing, but for, turning, but for the purpose of turning his eyes upon the triune God who rules heaven and earth, who raises the dead. Paul can endure this sentence of death because of God. Because God is a resurrecting God. This trial was sent to Paul so that he might know with absolute certainty the veracity of his words to the Romans in chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He goes on, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even death could separate Paul from the love of his God. Why? Because God raises the dead. And so hear the word of God for you, brother, sister. Nothing can separate you from the love of God 
for those who are in Christ Jesus, nothing can do that terrible work. Douglas Kelly writes on this passage, he says, We often ask, why is something in our life, or indeed our life itself, fallen flat? Sometimes God has let every door slam in our ministerial face, or our financial face, or our physical face, or whatever. Otherwise, we might have relied upon our intelligence, our beauty, our family, our cash, our whatever. So God closes every door and we are at the end of our resources. Then suddenly we realize that there is just one door. And if anything is to happen, it looks as if God will have to do it. Then God says, well, child, isn't that the point? Haven't you been telling others that? Don't you think it will work for you? That is when death works in us. And so let me ask. Certainly, you can think about the last 48 hours or so, this weekend, but maybe for you it's broader than that. Maybe, maybe you never lost power at all, and you're like, dude, get over it. It was windy. Move on. But what in your life offers you that moment to rely upon yourself? Where are you self-reliant? Where are you failing to rely upon God who raises the dead? Wherever it is, I'm saying this first to myself, stop. We must stop now. We must stop self-reliance. Take this very moment right now and hear the call of God to stop trusting in yourself. Our self-reliance is an affront to Him. It's not a little sin that God just can wave off and overlook. It is an attack on His very holiness, His sovereignty, in his rule of the world. So let us cut out our treasuring up and living upon ourselves. Live upon God. He's an infinite fountain of goodness that raises the dead. We're all going to die one day. Right? Every single person in this room. Every one of you. Every one of us. We are going to die. We must reckon with that fact. And we don't know when. But we do know that God is able to raise the dead. And how do we know this? Because he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born to the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life in perfect obedience to God's law in the place of sinners, and then he died a death in the place of sinners and was raised for the justification of sinners. The resurrection is proof that God loves his people and that nothing can separate them from him. And so when you happen upon suffering, or when suffering happens upon you, turn your eyes upward. Gaze into your Savior's smiling face and trust and hope in Him. I pray that the waves of your lives, the waves and winds of your lives will throw you upon the rock of ages. Pray that we would be driven to Jesus Christ. Now, Paul had despaired of life, and he was essentially on death row. But God had delivered him from such deadly peril. Paul not only trusted that God would raise him from the dead if he actually died, but he also believed that he could spare his life. Because it isn't just that you're doomed to die uh, very soon, but don't worry, because eventually you'll be raised from the dead. That is hope for sure. But God doesn't just raise the dead. He raises the nearly dead. 
God can deliver you out of your troubles without them ultimately taking your life. In John Bunyan's autobiography, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he reflects upon his own time spent in prison for preaching the gospel. And he writes about this text in 2 Corinthians. He says, It was of great use to me. By the scripture I was made to see that if I would ever suffer rightly, I must first pass a sentence of death upon everything that can properly be called a thing of this life. Even to reckon myself, my wife, my children, my health, my enjoyments, and all as dead to me, and myself as dead to them. The second was to live upon God that is invisible. As Paul said in another place, the way not to faint is to look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. That's 2 Corinthians 4.18 he's quoting there. Paul says that God had delivered them, and then he says that God will deliver them. I believe that Paul then qualifies the statement by saying, at least we have set our hope on him that will deliver us that he will deliver us. He's asserting his hope and trust that God will deliver him. And if not from the trial itself, from death itself. And so I pray that each one of us would set our hope on God, trusting him to deliver us. What about a proper response to affliction? He says, you must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Paul concludes this portion of this letter, this introduction, by asking for the prayers of the Corinthians. We pray and God answers. There's a lot that could be said about how intricately woven together prayer and providence are. Um, but for now, we'll just say this. It is a magnificent opportunity for us to see how God has, ha, He is willing to work through our prayers. Right? Right? Isn't it wild that you can make a request of God and that he would do something about it? You, us, what on earth, what business do we have asking God for anything? And yet, God says, ask and you shall receive. Paul asserts here, that he has great hope that God will deliver him provided that the Corinthians pray. He says, Corinthians, pray for me because if you don't, I might be toast. But if you continue to pray for me, I am confident that I will continue to experience these deliverances as God answers your prayer. And so what is our response to affliction? Pray. Prayer. Hope in God. Don't rely upon yourself. Rely upon God and give thanks. Give thanks even in the most difficult moments of your life. Not precisely for the difficult moment and the horrible thing that's happened to you. But give thanks that God is with you, that God has not abandoned you, that He is strengthening and equipping you in the midst of your suffering. And He's comforting you. Give thanks. And so if Bunyan is right, if living upon God that is invisible is the key to suffering rightly, what is the key to living upon God? Bunyan's answer that he got from Paul is to lay hold of Christ through his word. 
He writes, I never had in all my life so great an inlet into the Word of God as now, in prison. Those scriptures that I saw nothing in before were made in this place as, and state to shine upon me. Jesus Christ also was never, so, was never more real and apparent than now. Here in prison, I have seen him and felt him indeed. I have had sweeter sights of the forgiveness of my sins in this place and of, a, of my being with Jesus in another world. I have seen that here that I am persuaded I shall never, while in this world, be able to express. And so, as we begin to land the plane here, let me quote the end of the hymn I spoke of earlier, Be Still My Soul. Von Schlegel writes, Be still my soul, the hour is hastening on. When we shall be forever with the Lord, disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love's purest joy is restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed we shall meet at last. So church, let us learn to kiss the wave that drives us against the rock of ages. There is no other foundation upon which we may hope to build a holy and happy life. Let us learn to kiss the rod that strikes us, for it does so with the loving affection of a father. There is no other surety in heaven or on earth. There is nothing and no one except Jesus Christ that can or will save you from the wrath to come. From the sufferings and trials that you endure now. Though suffering, affliction, and death are our enemies, we, in a manner of speaking, can embrace them and love our enemies for though they crush us, they do not destroy us, and ultimately they only serve the great purposes of our Lord. Let us with Jonathan and Sarah Edwards, with Charles Spurgeon, John Bunyan, Katerina von Schlegel, and all the prophets and the apostles and all the saints throughout history treasure up the hard providence of God. For as another dear servant of the Lord who suffered greatly in his life once wrote, it is behind those difficult and hard providences, those frowning providences, that God hides a smiling face ever and always toward his children.